Hi, this is Steve with iFlow. Welcome to our video series. In this segment, we're going to be looking at uh, creating iFlow hybrid heating systems. So what we're doing is we're combining our hydronic furnace uh, with our uh, heat pumps, our cold climate heat pumps. So let's take a look. What is a hybrid heating system? Well, a hybrid heating system is a system, a heating system that is made up of two energy sources. Typically, we have uh, a gas furnace on one side, uh, a gas furnace or a hydronic, iFlow hydronic furnace with a tankless water heater, a boiler, or a combi boiler, but nonetheless a, a gas-based system on one side, and then we have an electric-based system on the other, and that could be uh, an air source heat pump, that could be a ground source heat pump, that could be um, a an iFlow hydronic furnace with a, an electric hot water provider, could be an electric boiler, could be a heat pump water heater, could be electric water heater, uh, but again, an electric source and a gas source. The homeowners can then manually choose by adjusting the thermostat. So for example, on the thermostat you could have the gas side connected to the W. So if they call for heat, um, then the gas side would come on. They could have the auxiliary or emergency heat. Uh, that could be the heat pump side. So the homeowner could actually switch on the thermostat manually to which one they want to run at any certain time. But we know that that's probably an inconvenience. It's probably not going to be done all that often. Um, and perhaps the homeowner would want something that would switch automatically. And in that case, we do have an iFlow, another product called the iFlow Smart Hybrid Heating Controller, uh, which we connect the furnace, uh, the gas side and the electric side to the switching controller. We enter some parameters that we want to decide how we switch between them. And then we will switch automatically using that, uh, that controller. So the homeowners would select uh, criteria parameters on the smart controller. Uh, and then it would uh, switch based on outdoor temperature, uh, time of day to avoid any peak rates periods, for example, on the electric side or the gas side. Uh, to minimize operational costs could be another objective. Uh, or to minimize GHG reduction. Uh, or to optimize uh, GHG reduction. So there could be multiple themes that the homeowner can uh, want to achieve with their hybrid system and the smart switching controller uh, from iFlow can, can do that. Uh, so how do we create uh, a hybrid heating system? So we have a suggestion. Uh, we can improve an existing heating system and we can actually double the efficiency of those systems uh, while lowering the overall operating cost. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to start by replacing the old air conditioners with a new iFlow inverter driven variable speed uh, cold climate heat pump. Uh, so uh, the existing stock of air conditioners in North America uh, is uh, about, the average is about 10 years old. So if we take those old air conditioners out, so the old outdoor unit, remove the air conditioner, replace it with a heat pump. Now a heat pump is just an air conditioner unit that can run backwards, if you want, through a reversing valve. It just changes the refrigerant flow so that um, instead of taking the heat out of your house and making it cooler, we take the, we actually put heat into the house uh, and take it from the outside. So. Um, the heat pump will still give you air conditioning all summer without problem, work the same way, uh, but it will also provide heating in the winter. So uh, again, we replace that old air conditioner, put in a new iFlow inverter driven variable speed heat pump. Um, we run the cold climate heat pump in the shoulder seasons. So we run it in September, October and November, uh, and then again in the spring, in March and April and May, when the COPs are highest. Uh, and those are the same times where the gas furnace, depending on the size of the furnace, may not be running ideally because it'll be uh, cycling on and off because the load isn't very high. So we're going to take the best of both. We're going to run the heat pump when the COPs are highest and when the heating capacity is there. Uh, and then when we get into uh, the middle of winter, uh, let's say December, January, February, where we actually need a lot of heating, um, the, and that's where the heat pump efficiency will slightly drop off because the heat pump will have a harder time extracting the heat out of the colder air. 
Um, so we stop using the heat pump, we switch over to the gas side, we've got lots of BTUs on the gas side, we have no issue providing the capacity, the heating capacity for the home. Um, and because the load is higher, the heating load is higher in December, January, February, the furnace may operate a little bit more steadily, uh, so you're not going to be cycling as much to so get much better efficiency. So we're kind of optimizing the operational uh, situations for both the gas and the electricity side. So let's take a look uh, on the on this side. You will see what we have here is we have the old outside air conditioning unit. We have a tank type water heater and we have a typical furnace. We've got the the ducting for the uh, both the uh, water heater and for the furnace. So what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to switch that out and we're going to switch the old AC unit and we're going to switch it out for an iFlow inverter heat pump. We're going to install the iFlow switching controller so that we can actually input the parameters and it will be automatic. There's no need for the homeowner to worry about uh, manually switching from, from electricity to gas. Uh, we wire the thermostat into the switching controller and then we wire the output to the heat pump from the switching controller and then we wire the output action to the furnace as well. So we will control when the, when the room needs heat, we're going to get the call for heating in and then based on the parameter set we'll decide do we call on the inverter heat pump or do we call on the furnace. So that's how we're achieving that in this situation. So we also have the option to run with the iFlow Hydronic Furnace. The iFlow Hydronic Furnace, um, if you are not sure what that is, it's basically an air handler unit. Uh, it works like a furnace. It will sit in the same place as your furnace where you have your return duct connected to it, your supply duct connected to it. Instead of having a gas burner though, we use hot water. And that hot water can be from whatever heat source uh, you have in the home, but uh, typically a tankless water heater for example, a condensing tankless water heater or a combi boiler if you're running some, some radiant heating for example. Uh, but all, this, all to say, we can also run the heat pump with the iFlow hydronic furnace and let's say a new condensing tankless water heater. So here we're getting the advantage of we've got an old uh, inefficient tank type water heater and we're upgrading to the condensing tankless. The, now that the condensing tankless is in, we've got a very, very high efficient, uh, highly efficient heat source, gas-based appliance that can then provide heating over to the iFlow hydronic furnace. So we're getting great efficiency that way. Uh, and we tie into the heat pump from the controller. In this case, we don't need the smart, or smart controller because all of those controls are actually built into our air handler. So all of that, all of the smart the smart switching and all those goodies are already built into the, the iFlow hydronic furnace. So we just wire the thermostat into the iFlow and then we wire the heat pump from the iFlow as well. And we will control again the switching over. So in this case we switch to electric. Uh, we switch to the heat pump when we want to run the heat pump if the rates are, the electricity rates are really low. But if they get high, if we hit a, a peak period for example in, in terms of electric rates, and we want to switch over, we can switch over to the gas side. We will start the pump and we'll bring on the tankless water heater and that'll give us heat into the house. So again, a combination system where we're using gas and electric. So that's how we would look in the mechanical room. That's the equipment we would switch out. And here's what your system would, would look like. So this is kind of the iFlow hybrid system where we have, let's say, a tank condensing tankless water heater is our gas source. We have a plumbing kit that would connect the, the, heat, the condensing tankless water heater to the iFlow hydronic furnace. So that plumbing kit makes everything simple and easy. It's got the isolation valve kit, it's got a pump, an expansion tank, a, a two-way valve, an air vent. Everything is potable rated. Um, again, fits right onto the system. Everything is consistent and nice. And then we have the cold climate heat pump. We've got our outdoor unit and then we've got the evaporator coils to match. Uh, again, for the Intercan rebate of $5,000, you need to match the system, so you may not be only changing the outdoor unit, the old air conditioner for the new heat pump. You may also have to change the evaporator coil, again, if you're looking for that matched pair for any grants or rebates. 
So why a combi system? Why consider a hybrid combi system? Well, again, upgrade to an iFlow inverter heat heating system and we can more than double the efficiency uh, of your heating system. And let's look at why. So decarbonization is a national goal, a national strategy both in Canada and the US. There are a number of initiatives both at the federal, the state, the provincial levels uh, to incentivize the uh, reduction in carbon emissions. Um, a lot of heat pump uh, rebates are out there um, and we can take advantage of some of those. Again, 47% of the homes in the US, and this, these are US stats, are heated with traditional natural gas. Uh, when we use heat pumps, uh, a lot of people with the first generation of heat pumps that weren't designed to run uh, at really cold temperatures, uh, often we're, we're, uh, we're operating, we're going into defrost mode a lot, we're relying on the electric resistance backup strip heating, uh, and that was running the bills up quite high. So quite expensive. Traditionally, it was quite, quite expensive to do that. Not anymore. Not with the cold climate heat pumps. Nearly 40% of the U.S. residential AC systems are 10 years old or more. So that's where the advantage is. So we've got uh, a lot of uh, a lot of AC units that could be switched out for heat pumps. Uh, and in terms of the rapid growth of ducted inverter products, so now when we we look at the majority of the heating systems in North America, they are ducted systems. They're not. They're not. There is ducting already in the home. So if we can take a heat pump, uh, take an evaporator coil, retrofit it into the existing ducted system. Uh, that's really going to be ideal in terms of re retrofitting uh, the number of homes uh, we, we have in North America uh, to, really make, to really move the ball forward in terms of decarbonization or reducing our, our GHG footprint uh, uh, somewhat. Uh, so anyway, uh, the year over year compound growth rate, 20% um, in terms of inverter um, uh, products being installed in ducted applications. So, um, all to say, these are some of our specs. So SEER 2 up to 17.5, uh, the ER2 to 11.7, HSPF2 uh, in zone 4, 10.5. Um, efficiencies can be as high as 300%. Now, that's probably tough for some people to, uh, um, to, to understand, uh, and we can appreciate that. Uh, it's probably beyond the scope of this uh, presentation to go into that, but all to say, uh, we measure the performance of heat pumps with a number called COP, the coefficient of performance. What we're measuring is the amount of energy in and then the amount of energy out. And for every kilowatt in, I'm getting a certain number of kilowatts out. With a heat pump, we can take, for one kilowatt in, we can have actually, believe it or not, we can have two or three or even four kilowatts of heating output for every kilowatt input. So that's why we're getting to this 300%. So if we're, if we're inputting one kilowatt and getting three kilowatts of heating out of it, that's great performance at 300%. Uh, so that's where the, the number comes from. That's the COP number, and we will look at the COP ratings of our, of our equipment. But all to say, um, that's where we're getting some energy savings, especially if we can pair that with some preferential electricity rates and run the heat pump when the rates are really low, then we can get some, some great energy savings. Um, in terms of comparing it to some of the other uh, types of heating, uh, especially oil, we know oil is expensive, electric resistance is expensive, natural gas is probably the most uh, economical competitor, but because we can get 300%, 400% out of some of the heat pumps for some periods of the, of the year, we're not going to get that in December, January and February uh, typically, um, but we can take advantage of those uh, rebates and, and have the operating cost be uh, similar. Um, Greenhouse gas emissions, so uh, we can cut, if we can reduce the, or if we can double the seasonal efficiency, doubling the efficiency means a reduction 
of carbon uh, to the uh, by half. Uh, so all of the exhaust that you would typically see, uh, we're going to cut that by half, and we just have a picture of LA uh, in there. Um, anybody that's flown into LA during the day, uh, you'll be greeted by that uh, kind of brown layer. It sits above. You can't see it from the ground. It's a beautiful blue sky, but when you fly in, you can definitely see it. So anybody that's done that will know. Um, so I just included that. So we're going to cut the, the uh, emissions by half. Um, and then, for the first time, you'll have dual energy options. So you can actually choose the fuel type that best matches the time of day or your, you know, your, uh, your gas, your, your um, uh, cost of gas or cost of electricity at any time of, uh, of, of the day. Uh, you might want to switch be between them. You have the choice now to select your energy source. Do I want to run the heating on gas or do I want to run the heating on electric? There are some uh, capital cost reduction incentives now. Uh, so depending on the state, uh, there are some federal rebates available. Um, there are some uh, grants available in Canada. So the, the Canada Greener Homes Grant. Um, our heat pumps qualify for a $5,000 rebate. Um, so that's a, that's a great thing. So uh, you have to check your local province or state or the federal, the federal programs that are available to capitalize on uh, some of the heat pumps, but definitely do that. Uh, uh, look into that first if you're wanting to claim them, figure out what uh, conditions are attached to each of those rebates, uh, and, then, um, and then move forward with your, uh, your, uh, your installation, your switch out. All right, so all of the iFlow heat pumps are, are designed for cold climates. Doesn't mean they can't be used in warmer climates, but they were designed to be able to operate in cold climates as well, um, providing the capability to do whole house heating throughout the winter. So even when it gets down to, um, you know, in terms of Celsius, when it gets down to minus 15, minus 20, minus 25, uh, you'll still be able to run your heat pump. Uh, now, of course, there's going to be a reduction in, in capacity, so we have to get into the sizing and be careful about the sizing of the heat pumps. So we have to see the curves, uh, but nonetheless capable of doing that. So let's look at some specs. So again, 100% uh, heating output down to minus 4 Fahrenheit or minus 20 Celsius with a COP of 2, so of up to 2. So what that means is we're running down to minus 4 Fahrenheit, minus 20 Celsius, we're, being, we're able to deliver 100% of that heating capacity. So if we have a 3 ton unit, 36,000 BTUs, we're able to deliver 36,000 BTUs at minus 20 Celsius with an efficiency up to 2, which means for every kilowatt in, we're getting 2 kilowatts of heating out of the heat pump. That's the efficiency of the, of the system. When we go down to minus 30 or minus 22 Fahrenheit, uh, then we'll, have, we'll be able to continue to operate. Even at those colder temperatures, we will still be able to operate. Most regular or traditional uh, air source heat pumps uh, were able to deliver down to about uh, 5, minus, minus 10, minus 15 Celsius. Um, but the heat delivery capacity really dropped off uh, and the COPs were much, much lower than what they were rated for. So um, the, new, the new cold climate heat pumps are a different, uh, different breed, different specs. Uh, so don't uh, so so don't tr don't necessarily uh, think oh tr heat pumps we've used them for years they haven't worked uh, they may not have been applied uh, in in situations where they they were um, and they maybe not had maybe did not have the technology that they do in the ones today but today those are the specs 100 percent capacity down to minus 20 Celsius or four fair minus four Fahrenheit with COPs up to two and continuous operation down to minus 30 Celsius or 20, minus 22 Fahrenheit. So, um, the iFlow heat pumps are all variable speed. Um, and variable speed, in addition to variable, or part of that variable speed is how do we control it? When, when it's starting to modulate up or down, how do we need to control that from 
the blower perspective. Uh, that's been the challenge, let's say, the communication challenge between the two. Um, but we've overcome that, again, with the iFlow inverter heat pump. The outdoor unit, right, the condenser unit, has the ability to analyze the temperature and pressure changes uh, on the line set coming in and out of the heat pump. Uh, and it's able to adjust its operation accordingly. So, if we are not taking a lot of BTUs off of the evaporator coil, then the outdoor unit is going to be able to see that and it will adjust accordingly. Uh, this is where we get into the uh, variable speed capacity capability. So the outdoor unit is going to react to what the indoor unit is, is doing. Uh, and if we're not needing a lot of heating or cooling, the unit's going to modulate down. If we need more heating or cooling inside, the unit's going to ramp up accordingly. So that's where we get uh, great uh, comfort, actually. Um, because different from a, a single speed or a two-speed two system, and they will run at one or two speeds cons uh, respectively, right? Uh, a single stage system is going to run at one speed. Uh, so if I need three, whether I need three tons of cooling or not, uh, it's going to give me three tons of cooling. So I have to have three tons of airflow across the evaporator to make sure it doesn't freeze up, which may be too much airflow for that time of day or that, that, that season. Uh, whereas a fully modulating system will be able to ramp up and down accordingly given the season, given the, 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 uh, the actual heat delivery or cool delivery into the house. Uh, and that's where we get uh, great comfort. Because that modulation will result in super steady and uh, super steady temperature delivery. And that's the ultimate in, in home comfort, comfort. We do that on the heating side with the, the, uh, the variable speed I flow. Uh, and you can look at some of the other videos we have on the website for those references. Uh, but now we can do it on the AC side as well, which is, uh, which is great. So the I flow inverters, uh, because of that ab ability to be self-adaptive, we can connect with anything out there. Uh, so any equipment, uh, so you compare the iFlow uh, heat pumps um, with any other equipment out there. You can pair it with the iFlow hydronic furnace without problem. But you can also connect it to any other furnace um, and any other thermostat out there as long as that furnace is able to accept uh, 24 volt uh, thermostat, third party thermostats. That's the only criteria. If that unit's able to work with a third-party thermostat, then we will be able to connect to that and make a, uh, make a great system. In terms of operation, the units are very quiet. All of our units are side discharge, uh, running down to about uh, as low as, uh, as 54 decibels. Compared to the top discharge, the kind of the cube units that you would traditionally see outside, they would run at, let's say, greater than 70. So we've got some definitely uh, uh, quieter options in terms of outdoor equipment these days. So uh, in terms of the mix and match of the systems and where you can put them, we've got uh, a few different options. So we can look at option one. Option one would be running with the iFlow inverter heat pump. Uh, and the iFlow hydronic furnace. Those would be paired together with a tankless water heater or a tank type water heater, a heat pump water heater, whatever the case may be. Um, that's doing your domestic, but also doing the heating hydronically. Uh, but then we can also do the heat through the heat pump. So we've got the, inv in the iFlow inverter heat pump, we've got the iFlow hydronic furnace, and then we can run in smart mode, meaning we don't even need a thermostat actually. The system can operate on its own, it can sense the return temperatures so it knows when it needs some heating, it knows when it needs some cooling and can adjust the system automatically. Next option would be running with a third party 24 volt thermostat. So this could be a Nest thermostat, this could be an Ecobee thermostat, this could be a Honeywell thermostat, whatever thermostat. It does not need to be a heat pump thermostat because the iFlow uh, because the iFlow hydronic furnace has that switching capability inside, it will determine whether we run the, uh, the heat pump or whether we run the hydronic side. Um, so all we need the thermostat to do is send us a signal. That could be as simple as three wires. 
I have an R, I have a W, and I have a Y. If I've got three wires in my wall, I can make this system run without problem. So I can have just any, any 24 volt thermostat provide the signal. Um, that comes down to the iFlow. The iFlow will then decide, do I turn, turn on the hydronics or do I turn on the inverter heat pump? Uh, again, working with the 24 volt thermostat. The next option would be, okay, I can run the, the iFlow inverter heat pump. If I already have a, an air handler in there that's operating, I can do that. No problem. I can use my 24 volt thermostat. That will connect to the switching controller. Uh, that will switch to the switching controller, uh, and then I can run my air handler as I was, or I can run the heat pump. And then the last option would be the third party controller uh, with the iFlow hydronic furnace, but then let's say you didn't want to go with the cold climate heat pump because you're in Florida, you're in California, you're in Texas. Um, you want to run, you have your existing um, heat pump or heat pump that's rated for, in, in the US we have the north zone and we have the south zone, so perhaps you've got a heat pump that's rated for the south zone and you have it in already, it's relatively new, you'll keep that and you'll just change out uh, uh, to the iFlow hydronic furnace that has the switching capability inside. So, a few different options, we can always mix and match to make these hybrid systems. So there's not, you're not limited to this piece of equipment and that piece and that's it. You can mix and match whatever you like to make your system. So it gives you lots of flexibility uh, in terms of retrofits for the, for the contractors that are doing that. In new construction, you have the ability to mix and match the different types of components that you want in your home. So. Um, Again, lots of flexibility. So, let's look at the iFlow heat pump lineup. And this is as of October 1st, 2023. So, uh, we have a number of different units. Uh, it's maybe some too small to see. Uh, this will be up on the website. But nonetheless, we have any ranging from the outdoor units, ranging from one and a half tons, right up to four and a half tons. Uh, and then we have the indoor evaporator coils again from one and a half tons going right up to the five ton case coils. So our, the cabinet sizes are eight, from 18 inch right up to 24 inch. So we're running from a B cabinet right up to a D cabinet on our units. Most of the units will require uh, a transition. Um, when you're pairing it with an iFlow um, hydronic furnace, our hydronic furnaces are relatively small. Um, taking up less footprint in the house, so that's great. A lot of the architects like that. Um, but the case coils too, again, because of the cold climate rating on them, to get the higher performance, uh, we need to upsize the coils. So we're all, in many cases, we're running um, a unit, let's say an outdoor unit that can do two, or two tons and we'll be pairing it with a coil that can do two and a half or three tons. The larger coil gives us more surface area, we get better performance out of that and we can qualify or we can uh, have that run in a cold climate situation better than uh, it would if there was a smaller indoor coil. So, all to say, um, we have the coils, uh, the outdoor units and the indoor units. Uh, if you are looking for a rebate or a grant, uh, you will likely need a matched pair. So we do have, and we've we provided here, the AHRI reference, which uh, most of the utilities use uh, uh, to qualify the equipment that's going in. Uh, those AHRI numbers are all there. Uh, you have the uh, eligibility uh, for tax deductions on the, uh, uh, from the uh, IRS. Uh, and then you have the Green Home Grant eligibility or not, and then the Cold Climate designation. So some of the information there that you may need. And then we have the uh, we have the actual specs. So we have again same model numbers, right? Outdoor unit, indoor unit, AHRI reference number. And then we have the cooling capacity, anywhere from 18,000, so a ton and a half, up to uh, 53,000, uh, so just under five tons. Uh, we have the ER ratings, we have the SEER ratings, um, uh, and then we go into the heating capacity. And we have the heating capacity at different temperatures. The heating capacity at 47 Fahrenheit or 8.3 Celsius. We have it at 
17 Fahrenheit or minus 8.3 Celsius. We have it at minus uh, or 5 Fahrenheit or minus 15 Celsius. Uh, and then we have the COPs at those two regions and the uh, HSPF numbers. So again, all to say those are the reference numbers. I don't know if they're that clear here, uh, but then you can reference your uh, rebate requirements or grant requirements. Make sure that the equipment that we have matches the different criteria that are required by your state, your province, your, you know, whichever government your rebate or grant you're applying for. Make sure you meet the specifications. If there's something that you're unsure about, give us a call at iFlow and we'll help you, uh, we'll help you through that. The iFlow heat pump warranty. Uh, the warranty you have on the heat pumps is very similar to what we have on our hydronic furnaces. So, uh, out of the box, out of the box, you open the box, you install it, you do nothing more. You're going to get three years on all parts, except for the cold climate air source uh, compressor, the, heat ex the outdoor heat exchanger coil, the, so the condenser heat exchanger or condenser coil, and the evaporator coil. You'll get five years on those. Then if you register those within uh, 90 days of installation or in new construction, uh, 90 days after the changeover of the home, then you'll get five years on parts, 10 years on the heat exchanger, and then you get a 20% 20, 20 uh, limited life credit uh, on the equipment for as long as you own the home. So uh, though that's kind of the product and where we're going and hybrid systems and how you put them together. So let's look at the efficiency. So can installing an iFlow heat pump really double a present heating system's efficiency? And the answer is yes. So let's take a look at an example. So here we've got a, th a traditional, right? This is just a traditional generic heat pump. Uh, this is a BTU capacity delivery versus temperature chart, which is typical. Uh, we have BTUs on this side, this is BTU delivery capacity of the heat pump, and then we have temperatures. Now, as it gets colder outside, it makes sense. It's getting colder outside, your heat pump outside is trying to extract any residual heat that's left in the air outside, but as it gets colder, it's having a much harder time to do that. Um, how do we get, how do we even extract heat out of those colder temperatures? Well, the refrigerant that we're using is much colder than even the outdoor temperatures. So if the refrigerant is much, much colder than the outdoor temperature, even though it's very cold outside, winter temperatures, it's going to extract heat. It's going to see that as heat, even though we would not see it. We see it as cold. Um, but nonetheless, as the temperature decreases, the heat pump does have harder and harder time pulling that, uh, that heat out of the air. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that as it gets colder outside, the unit decreases in the amount of heating that it's able to provide. So, for example, if it's 50 degrees outside, the unit's able to provide uh, definitely 36,000 BTUs, no problem, that's the three ton. So, 36,000 BTUs with no problem. If it's 30 degrees outside, now it's only able to deliver, uh, let's call that uh, 27,000 BTUs or 28,000 BTUs. So it gets even colder outside. Now it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit outside. What are, well, now we're down to 22,000 BTUs. So as it gets colder outside, the heat pump has a harder time extracting the heat. Thus, it doesn't have the heat to provide into your house. So the heating capacity actually goes down. So hopefully that makes, makes some sense. At the same time, as it's, because it's having a harder time extracting the heat out, it has to work harder. And as it works harder, the efficiency goes down. So for every kilowatt that it's bringing in, it's got to work harder to deliver the heat out because it has to work harder to extract the heat from that colder outdoor temperature. So as a result, the efficiency drops as well. So again, when we're at 50 degrees, the COP is 3.8. So for every kilowatt input, we get 3.8 kilowatts of heating output. Great performance, right? Almost four, four times the input. Great efficiency. But then as we go down to 30, 
degrees outside. Now we've got a COP of 2.9. And as we go down to 10, now we've got COP of 2.3. And as we go into the minus temperatures, we're down to 1.5. So it's still, for every kilowatt we put in, we're still getting 1.5 kilowatts of heating out. Um, but it's not the same. If we're expecting to get 3 tons of, of heating at this temperature, then we haven't sized the system properly. But again, this is a generic regular heat pump. This is not a cold climate heat pump. This is not the iFlow heat pump. This is just a generic heat pump that we're, we're looking at here in our example. So when we put those two together, we have the heating capacity, we have the COP line. We see that it's dropping in unison, both the delivery capacity and the COPs. So what does that mean for our heating? Well, let's look at a, 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 tip, a typical load. So here we have an example of Toronto. This is Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, here's the heating curve. So we have July, August, September, October, November. So we've got the months on the, on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, both in top and bottom, so you can see. And then as it gets colder, we drop in temperature. So we drop down to our coldest and then up. Now, this is the heating curve. These are the temperatures, both in Fahrenheit and in Celsius, that we're dropping down to. Uh, so let's look at the BTU load. So we're assuming this is a 40,000 BTU house. So this could be, let's say, a, a 2,500 square foot house, 2,800 square foot house um, in, uh, in, in Toronto, two levels without problem. That would be, a, let's say, a typical heating load, 40,000 BTUs. So let's say at 70 degrees, 21 Celsius, we don't need any heating, we don't need any heating at all. So we're just going to uh, say that this is our zero BTU line. So anything above that, we don't need any heating. But let's go down through the seasons now. So uh, if it's now, at this point, we need 7,000 BTUs, and we need 14,000 BTUs, 21,000, 28, 35, and then we have 42. So what's our load? Our load is 40,000. So where does that come in? That comes about here. So when do we need 40,000 BTUs? We need it in the middle of January, uh, December and January. Uh, and it's only to meet the maximum uh, load. So this is our average temperature, and this is the high and low for the days for the heating season. So let's look at month by month now. So in August, what do we need? Well, it could be just a cold night. We, during the day, we typically don't need anything. But, you know, come towards the end of August, there might be a cold night where we might want to turn on the fireplace or turn on the, the heater, for example. So we might need, you know, 5,000 BTUs or 6,000 BTUs. In September, now we're down to maybe 10 or 11,000 BTUs. In October, now we're down to 20,000 BTUs. In November, we're 27,000 BTUs. Uh, in December, we're 35,000 BTUs. Now, in January, we're 40,000. And in February, we're just under 40,000. And then we crawl back up. In March, we need uh, maybe 33 at maximum. And then gradually, we'll... So, you see that the heating curve is variable. Right? This is, every winter is going to be the same. We get, you know, as we go into fall, we get a little colder, the days get shorter, the nights get longer, the days get colder. That's natural, that happens every year. There's no, there's no getting around that. So we need equipment that will deliver variable capacity throughout the season. And that's why we like the variable speed inverter compressors. So, that's our heating curve. Now, we saw that the heat pumps can deliver lots of heating capacity during the warmer months, or let's say the shoulder seasons, um, but then have a hard time delivering capacity in the middle. So let's look at the offset. So we're going to take that curve and the heating load that we have, and we're going to, that's represented in this blue line, and we're going to offset that with the heating curve that we saw earlier. And then we're going to say, okay, what does this mean? Well, as it gets colder outside, I need more and more BTUs. So what do I need? I need from 100,000 up to 40,000 BTUs. So now I'm going to plot this out. 
So where those two lines intersect, right, at this point, that looks like about 30 degrees. That's where my heat pump, my heating load, right, my house's heating load is going up. But my capacity, the ability of the heat pump to deliver, doesn't match the heating load. So at this point, that's called, uh, this is where we're going to be short on heating. So if we fill that in, we're going to run the heat pump until we get to that point. And then we're going to switch over and we're going to run the gas side where we've got lots of BTUs. Um, and hopefully over that, that, uh, that load, uh, so now we're at a load of about uh, 27, 28,000 BTUs. Hopefully the furnaces will run a little better. They won't be cycling as much. The, the iFlow hydronic furnace will be running great um, with top efficiency. Uh, but then we've just looked, the, the switchover point is 30 or minus 1 Celsius. So for every home, we can actually calculate the balance point, the switchover point, based on the equipment, based on the heating load that you've got, and set that up and enter those into the parameters of the smart controller to be able to switch back and forth. When we get, when we get a call for heat, we'll look at the outdoor temperature. We'll say, hey, am I above 30? If yes, then we'll run the heat pump. If no, then we'll run the gas furnace. Now, we'll run the heat pump, but are we in a peak, are we in a peak time zone? Like, am I getting, am I, uh, uh, peak rate time, and if I'm peak rate time, then even though I'm above 30 and I should be running the heat pump, we have it set that, hey, I don't want to run at peak times because I'm going to get charged for excess of excessive electricity use, for example, then we'll run the heat pump during that, or the furnace on that side, or the hydronic side on that, on that, uh, in that situation. So we enter the parameters to be able to switch as we need. So anyway, this is how we would set the system up to, uh, to run. So then we go back to our, our home. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, we've just calculated the balance point of the switchover is 30 or minus 1 Celsius. So we're going to switch over at that point. So we're going to run the heat pump from the heating seat, the start of heating season, which again is when, when it goes below 70. And we're going to run it all the way to the first week of December. So this will be heat pump time. And then when we go below that, 30 degrees or one, minus 1 Celsius. Now we're going to run the gas, the gas side, the gas furnace or the gas hydronic furnace, uh, the iFlow hydronic furnace with the combi boiler or tankless. Whatever the case may be, we're going to run the gas side. And then once the temperature goes above that 30 or minus 1 again, then we're going to run the heat pump again. So we're going to run the heat pump, basically, or we're going to run the ga a gas furnace from the first week of December to the first week of March. During this period, and we're going to run the heat pump the other times. So what does that do? All right, so let's plot that out. Let's look at the actual COP at each period. We're going to look at the amount of heat load during that time period. And we're going to multiply those together to give us a total effective percentage of heating load that that's contributing to. Uh, so we calculate, right, as the, as the months get colder into December, the heating load goes up. We're going from COPs of 3.8, 3.8, then down to 2.3 in November, because the heat pump's starting to have a harder time. And we're switching over to the gas furnace. This is a condensing furnace, in this case, a 95% AFUE, 95% efficiency. Why? Because it's running a little bit more steady. It's not cycling. It's not the shoulder season. Uh, so we do that January, February, uh, December, January, February. And then we go to March, and we switch back to the heat pump, because it's getting warmer out. 2.2, 3.6, or 3.8. So then we put that all together, and we can then calculate, based on the total contribution, the amount of heat used in each month, we can calculate that contribution, and we can calculate the effective COP. Well, it's not really a, an actual COP, um, but it's a relative... It's the best thing we can do to compare um, when we're using a hybrid system and we relate it to something that's comparable. We say, okay, this would be the effect of, of or the, the same as having a 1.9 continuous heat pump. So we've gone from before that, when we just had the old air conditioner in, we were using the furnace to run all the heating in the winter. So what was our efficiency? It was... 95 at best, but in the shoulder season when it was cycling, it would go down. 
maybe to you know, low 90s, uh, mid 80s, somewhere in that range. So the overall efficiency would probably be somewhere in the 90% range when you take in the cycling. Um, and now we're going and we're bringing it up to an effective COP of 1.94, which basically doubles the efficiency of the system. And there's no risk of heating shortages. Right? We're able to cover the entire heating load. We're not worried that the heat pump's going to go below the balance, below the capacity point, and not be able to deliver heat into the home when the family needs it. That's, that would be a worst case scenario. We're going to avoid that by having the switching controller uh, switch back and forth as we need. Now, let's say we have an 80% furnace. So we've got a mid-efficiency furnace. We don't have a high-efficiency furnace. It's not in the budget to change the furnace out. So we put the, put the, the iFlow uh, heat pump in. Uh, we remove the smart controller, but we're using the existing furnace. So, okay, what would that be? Well, our, we're going to run at 0.8. We're going to use the same numbers that we did previously for the heat pump. We're going to run in the same type of season. We've just got 80% now. That gives us a total effect of COP of 1.86, so a little lower than what we had with the condensing efficiency of 1.94, but not that bad. Now we compare that 0.8, right? We would have been running at 80% efficiency through the winter or a little bit lower. And now we're increasing that to 1.86, giving us a 2.35. So 235% improvement on the efficiency of the existing system. So this is how we are putting these systems together. We're putting a hybrid, or putting a heat pump in, creating a hybrid system, creating a smart switching environment, and getting doubling the doubling the efficiency of our existing system cutting the amount of emissions the gas uh, the gas emissions our ghg output our carbon footprint in half so you say oh that's great that's wonderful we've got uh, we've got our system in place now how do we control it right how do we how do we control the switching between these two things so we'll look at that next So let's look at the iFlow solution. So this is our uh, this is our iFlow uh, hybrid smart or smart hybrid heating controller. Uh, again, this is um, we have all of this control built into our iFlow hydronic furnaces. So we've just created a separate controller for situations where you want to use our heat pump, but you've got an existing furnace that you just put in three years ago. It's 97% efficient. It's a great little furnace. We're going to improve it by putting in the heat pump instead of the air conditioner and be able to run the dual fuel. As we just said, we're going to double our efficiency of the system. Great, all great stuff. You didn't have it in the budget to, to switch out the new furnace for the uh, iFlow, which is fine. So we use our heating controller and we'll show you how, what we do with that. So this is the, uh, this is the inside of the unit. Uh, we have some additional goodies. We have an outdoor temperature sensor. We have a humidity sensor. We have a return and a supply air temperature sensor that will go into your ducting. And then we have uh, an evaporator sensor, which will be your freeze protection. Uh, and then we have a suction line temperature sensor, which will be um, your condenser uh, supply temperature sensor, if you will. So what do we do with all those sensors? Uh, well. We control the switchover between the heat pump and the gas based on the outdoor temperature. So we use this, again, we calculated before in the previous slides that, hey, at that 30, minus one cell, 30 Fahrenheit, minus one Celsius, that was our switchover point. Um, that was the outdoor temperature. So we have a physical outdoor sensor that will then help us determine what the temperature is. So even if the internet goes down and we don't know what the temperature is because our internet is down, our thermostat, our Nest or Ecobee can't see the outdoor temperature because the internet's down. We still have that. So the, our system is not internet based. It's you can be internet based if you wanted to, but you can be you can be offline without any problem as well and still get the same capability and switching capability because we have the outdoor sensor. Um, for our utility partner friends, our system. We do all the hardware and software internally at iFlow. So we can have this 
utility demand response capable. So if your local utility wants or needs to use more electricity or more gas, depending on the uh, supply uh, at the utility level, then we can have a system where we can make it advantageous to both the homeowner and to the utility to work together to switch between the devices. Uh, and that's customizable through our software site. We can make APIs for you to help you communicate between them. Uh, we can wire with any thermostat. We do not need a heat pump thermostat with an iFlow, so you don't have to buy an expensive $200 or $300 or $400 thermostat. Um, we have this all built into our unit, so you can use any thermostat you want. It can have any wires that you want. It can have as minimum of a minimum of three wires, an R, a W, and a Y. So an R to power, then a heating and a cooling. That's all we need. We can then decide internally, do we run the furnace or do we run the heat pump? So we have that brains. We don't need the thermostat to have that. It just needs to tell us when I need heating, when I need cooling. Send a signal down on the W or the, or the Y and we'll, we'll take it from, from there. So no heat pump thermostat is required. Um, the supply and air temperature sensors, that will actually tell us what's going on. So when we call on the, the heat pump, for example, or we call on the furnace, when our sensors are in the supply and return, we can actually see, is the system performing well? How long has it been operating in this mode? Is it, you know, if it's been running in heat pump mode for an hour and the return air temperature hasn't increased at all, then we know, okay, we've got a, a problem on the heat pump side, it's not able to deliver at this capacity, so maybe we'll switch over to the gas side. Or if there's a, an equipment error, an equipment error on the gas side, or an equipment error on the electric side, well, we can switch, we can see that, hey, we're calling for heat, but we're not getting any heat, because we're actually monitoring the supply and return air temperature, which is something that any, furnace, uh, any thermostat cannot do. Um, we have remote diagnostics capability here. Through our app, you can connect this to the internet, right? We do have Wi-Fi capability on this. Uh, once it's connected to the net, then you as the homeowner have access to your unit. You can see what it's doing. You can see how it's performing. Um, and we can help with troubleshooting uh, on the uh, troubleshooting and remote diagnostics as well. We can push any error codes out to your, to your phone or out to our, our central support center where we can see if we get a call, we might know that your system is having an issue before you do or at the same time you do um, and we can see if we can, we can assist. Um, so again, internet connection is not required. So how would we wire this to the system? So as I mentioned, you can use any thermostat you want. Um, all we need is three wires to the iFlow, the R, the W, and the Y. Uh, that's coming into our unit. This is the outdoor sensor, right? The outdoor sensor that we talked about previously. It's going to sense that outdoor temperature, which will control the switching. That wires to this contact. That should ideally be on the north wall. Uh, just don't have it directly in the sun on the south, let's say, in the south side um, of, the, of the house where it's going to get sun all day. If it is, if, it, if that's the only place you can put it, try and put it in some sort of shaded uh, area or put a little cover on it, for example. But ideally on the north wall, but that connects to the board. So we have the outdoor temperature sensor, we have the thermostat. Those are our inputs. And then our outputs, we will go to the heat pump. And for the iFlow heat pump, we just need three wires. That's it. We need, uh, we need Y, C, and we need the reversing valve, so O or B, right? So just three wires, that's all we need. Um, and then we go over to the furnace, and we can have as many wires as you want to your furnace. Uh, we have, so we have Y1, Y2, W1, W2, G, R, and C. So whatever your thermostat may, may need, depending, or your furnace may need, we can supply that. But in addition, as you saw by the accessories, we have our supply, right? We have a return air temperature sensor. We have our supply air temperature sensor. We actually have a humidity sensor as well that we would put in the return duct, sensing the humidity of the air. 
and then controlling your humidifier if you want. So we have lots of, lots of goodies uh, in here. Uh, the other thing we do, as we, as we saw by these sensors, we have the evaporator temperature sensor, which is our freeze protection, and we have our suction line temperature sensors, which will tell us what the outdoor unit, what the compressor condenser unit is actually delivering on the line set. So we have the evaporator temperature sensor, it connects to the top of the coil, and that will tell us if we're ever, ever getting close to freezing on the coil, and then we can stop the compressor. Why? Because we control it, we control the output to the compressor here. So if we see some freeze up of the coil, we can stop the compressor. We keep the, we'll keep the blower running, so we'll keep the furnace, uh, the heat call for heat running, so the, the blower is going to run, but we're just stopping the condenser to uh, avoid any freeze up. So with the iFlow system and the iFlow smart control, you're never going to freeze up a coil on your system. Uh, secondly, we have the supply temperature. So we have a sensor connected to the supply sensor uh, sub suction line coming from the condenser. So we see what temperature is being supplied by the condenser. If the temperature isn't above, let's say, 90, then we're not going to start the blower of the furnace because we know we're going to be blowing cold air into the house. Um, so we're only going to start the blower when this temperature goes above 90. Now the other thing is we can watch that. If it's going into defrost mode too often, we will see the change in temperature here. And we will know, oh, the outdoor unit's gone into, um, gone into defrost mode. And if we see that cycling too often, we'll know that the heat pump's having trouble. Um, if the heat pump is not able to supply 90, we've called for heat, the outdoor temperature is warm, or warmer than 30, let's say, we should be calling on the heat pump, We've sent the signal out, we're not getting any temperature here, okay, the heat pump has a problem, let's switch over, we'll run the gas. So we have some emergency backup functionality in there as well. So all of this is in the uh, smart switching controller, something that your thermostats would not, uh, would not ever have. So again, we use any thermostat, we don't need a heat pump, uh, we don't need a heat pump thermostat. Three wires, only three wires. If you have more wires from your thermostat, not a problem. But even a minimum of three wires, we can operate with without problem. Just the R, uh, W, and the Y. Um, I'll just go back to that. We we did have uh, we do. I've received calls from contractors where, hey, I've only got three or four wires in the wall. I need to use you know, this type of thermostat because there's no other way to control it. And no, with the iFlow, again, we just need the three wires. You bring it in, tell us when there's a call for heating, call for cooling, we'll take care of the rest of it without a problem. Uh, and then again, only three wires out to the outdoor unit. So three wires in, three wires out. Uh, that's all uh, easy, simple, easy stuff. Okay. Now, you say, okay, well, we only have three wires. What about fan control? Well, if, if I want 24-hour circulation to minimize stratification in my home, I have pets, so I want to clean the air, I have allergies or dust or whatever the you know, reason you may want, 24-hour circulation uh, of the fan. Well, again, if we only have three wires because your previous thermostat or your older thermostat didn't have that, uh, and to try and run another wire through, let's say it's a finished basement, you know, trying to fish a wire up to the, where the thermostat is, that might be difficult or impossible. Well, we can do that in the room itself. So on the controller, we can just have a jumper wire between R and G, and we can create that 24, uh, the 24 7 circulation of the fan, uh, and we would set the fan on a G call to run low. Uh, and then we get that. So there are ways we can uh, manipulate the wiring a little bit to get a circulation when we only have three wires in the wall. If we have more wires from the thermostat, not a problem. We can accept all of those, uh, whatever you like, and we can set, accept the output uh, or send the output to the furnace, however you like. Uh, if you're not using an iFlow and you need more wires, again, not a problem. We can accommodate all of that in the hybrid control. So, 
yes, using the uh, iFlow Smart Hybrid Heating Controller uh, and the iFlow Heat Pump, you can double the efficiency of any existing furnace uh, and AC system in, the, uh, in North America. So maybe we'll take a break there. Um, for those who want to continue on, we will look at how the iFlow hydronic furnace could make that whole system even better. So uh, let's call this part two. So as we get into part two of our heating, our hybrid uh, heating system control, um, we'll look at the iFlow hydronic furnace and the heat pump solution. So now we're going to go back into our mechanical room. We're going to change the outdoor unit to an iFlow condensing uh, unit. Uh, and we're going to install a tankless water heater. So we've got the condensing tankless water heater, we've got the iFlow, we've got our AC coil, our return supply, mechanical room, this is what, uh, what it would look like. So again, we replace the, AC, the old AC with the iFlow inverter variable speed heat pump. We upgrade uh, to a condensing tankless water heater. Um, we replace the old furnace with an iFlow hydronic furnace. So the old furnace was, would have been here with the return duct connected to it. So we switch out the furnace for an iFlow hydronic furnace. Uh, we eliminate the need for the second vent. Right? So if it's, a, if it's a B vent that was on your furnace, there's no need to uh, do that. Why? Because we're getting all of the heat from the condensing tankless water heater. We don't need a vent of our own. We're just taking the water from that appliance and bringing it in and sending it back to that appliance for reheating. So only one set of vents. That's the key. Uh, and we'll uh, improve the overall heating performance um, by approximately 10% over even the best Energy Star rated furnaces, and that's bar none. We'll test against any system out in the market without problem. We'll pay for it. If we lose, if we don't beat it by 10%, we'll, uh, we'll pay for all the testing. Uh, so you get the best efficiency and the best comfort of any HVAC system in the industry, again, bar none. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at the performances. So what we have here and we've done this, uh, this presentation in some of our other videos, so if you want to reference those videos uh, for a more extensive look at it, uh, those are available. But all to say, this is our average industry heating curve for condensing furnaces. Uh, this, is, uh, this is made up of eight condensing furnaces on the Energy Star program. Uh, and what, we, what we've seen is the heating load Again, regardless of where you are, this heating curve is the average of all of these 10 locations. Uh, if you're in a warmer location, your heating load will move a little bit to the left. If you're in a colder location, your heating load is going to be a little bit to the right. But on average, in all of these 10, this was the heating load. So where's my total demand? Somewhere here between you know, 12 and 18, so let's call it 15,000 BTUs is my average load. Uh, across the US. Nowhere near 60,000 BTUs or 80,000 BTUs or 100,000 BTU furnace that we'd be typically pulling out. Uh, the heat loads are actually much lower. So, what happens when we have a furnace, a single stage, two stage, or even modulating furnace, when they have to operate at lower BTU levels like 15,000, 18,000, 20,000, or 9,000 BTUs? They have no choice but cycle and they cycle off. And every time they cycle off, they have to post purge their vent out. So they're ex 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 exhausting some heat out of the vent pipe, losing efficiency. Uh, and this is what happens to the efficiency. We have the efficiency on this curve. We have the heating load on the horizontal axis. So we can see that as the heating load decreases, as the heating load decreases, so does the efficiency of the gas furnaces because they are cycling on and off as the load gets lower right if it's a you saw by the the curve that we showed in Toronto where you know you could need you know 7000 BTUs 10000 BTUs 15000 BTUs if i've got a single stage furnace 
60,000 BTUs, I'm delivering 60,000 BTUs. If I only need 15,000 on a cold October night, it's a quarter of what the furnace can actually run or, or deliver, so it's only going to run a quarter of the time. It's going to run a quarter of the hour. It's going to run 15 minutes of every hour. So it'll be on for one, off for three, on for one, off for three. That could be on for five, off for 15, and do that cycle three times for, for an hour. Um, it's going to cycle three times in that hour. When it, when it cycles off, it post purges and starts, has to start up again. Those are all losses that aren't included in their AFUE number. Um, but they, are, uh, they definitely come to uh, show uh, when we're doing actual load testing and we're measuring the, the gas and the electricity consumption during that period. Whereas the iFlow and the condensing tankless water heater, they were able to do much better even when we're modging at lower inputs because their burner, their, the range that they can operate, they're not single stage, they're not two stage, they're fully variable. You know, when you're running your, your hot water, which the, you know, the tankless water heaters are designed for, um, you could be running a small lab in the, in the bathroom at 0.5 gallons a minute, 0.6 gallons a minute. Um, and then 10 minutes later, you could get in the shower and you're running, you know, 2.2 gallons a minute on the hot side two for 2.5 for total flow. Uh, and then you could turn on the, on the bathtub, right, and run the, the faucet full open. Um, the burner has to react. You know, when you're running just the lab, it runs down. When you're running the full bathtub open, it's, it's ramped up to maximum. And anywhere in between there, but it can't scald you. So it's got to be very, the burner has to be very accurate in terms of its temperature delivery. Uh, the BTUs we're delivering into the water, so it doesn't overheat, it doesn't scald you. And then it can't underperform. You turn it on, you turn your bathtub on, you want, you, you're not going to be happy with 70 or 80 degrees of heat out of there. You want it at, you know, 105, 110, 120, 124. You're like, okay, that's hot water. So the burners are able to adjust a lot better than the furnace burners are. This point, and that's it. That's allowed us to uh, outperform. So what's the outperformance? On the low end side, you can imagine, furnace is cycling more, tankless and iFlow cycling less. So we got a 12% 12, 12 advantage here in terms of performance improvement. We're running always above 90, and the furnaces are down to low 80s. Uh, on the high side, even when we're running at 30,000 B2s, there's still gonna be some cycling on the furnace side, typically. Um, and so the advantage decreases, but we're still performing really, really well. Uh, and we've got a 5.5% advantage there for an average total increase of about 9%. So we can easily say, or confidently say, that the iFlow uh, tankless, condensing tankless combination can outperform even the best modulating condensing, or the best condensing furnaces on the Energy Star program by approximately 10% because of the reduction in cycling. So when we go back to our temperature uh, chart that we looked at for Toronto, we can see that we've got a 60,000 BTU single stage furnace. It's always going to be oversupplying, delivering more heat than I need in the house at any time because our load's only 40,000. But I couldn't find a 40,000 BTU furnace. The 60s are available. That's what the wholesaler had in stock. It was cheaper, um, whatever the case may be, that's what I put in. You're not doing any favors by putting in that single stage unit because it's going to be cycling all the time. So a lot of contractors say, well, a two stage is going to be better, right? We'll put in a two stage, it'll be, the performance will be great. Well, a two stage, the, the stage, the, 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 uh, the lower stage is going to operate at 70% typically of maximum. So if maximum 60,000, stage one is going to be 42,000. 42 is still over the whole load of the house. So the minimum input is really not going to help us much at all. So let's look at a modulating furnace. So the best modulating furnace out there, 24,000 BTUs, 23,000 BTUs in that range, 23, 24. So that's going to be decent so when we get into December, January, February, and March, it's going to perform well, but in the shoulder seasons, it's still going to be cycling. Whereas 
If we look at a condensing tankless, in this case we're looking at the Navium. For example, we've got the 240A2 or the 240S2, the minimum input is 13,300. So in this case, we get another extra, almost another extra month and a half of operation in the no cycling zone, in the, right, because the modulation range of the Navian is able to accommodate, so that if we need 15,000 BTUs, we deliver 15,000 BTUs. And then if we look at the Navian MP180, which is the minimum input is 10,000 BTUs, even better. So now we're going to be running from October all the way through to middle of May. Uh, so basically the entire heating season will be fully modulating without any cycling at all on that system. So it's just, if your house needs 18,000 BTUs, we deliver 18,000. If it needs 24, we deliver 24. So again, perfect, perfect modulation. So now let's look at the, another advantage of the iFlow Navian combination in particular, is that we can communicate between the two appliances. So we have a Navian tankless water heater. In this case, we've got a combi boiler. Same, it'll work the same way in terms of the communication. Uh, with an iFlow hydronic furnace, uh, we've got the cold climate heat pump outside. We've got a, we're going to be able to switch between them. Um, it's going to be the ideal HVAC system. It's going to have the best efficiency and the best comfort of any system out there. So this video, I'm going to show you a video now, and it's going to demonstrate our outdoor reset capability. So we saw in the accessories to the um, smart hybrid controller, we had an outdoor sensor. And that outdoor sensor, we mentioned, should be on the north wall. That's reading the outdoor temperature. And it's telling us, hey, it's getting colder outside ramp up the heat. It's getting warmer outside, ramp down the heat. It's getting really warm outside, turn on the cooling. Automatically by, by uh, looking at the outdoor temperature. So, but more than that, we're going to tell the Navian at what temperature to operate at. So, um, let's go through the, the video here. We'll turn it on. Hi, this is Steve with iFlow, and welcome to our video series. We are at uh, one of Eastbrook Homes, uh, we are at an Eastbrook Homes uh, location in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where they've installed the Navian uh, NCB with the iFlow air handler. So we're just going to run through the communication between the two units. So uh, we have a communication cable that runs between the Navian. So you can see it here, one end is labeled Navian, and that plugs in to the board, and then it runs all the way over, and it will run over to the iFlow. And we can tell that there's communication on by the blinking red and green lights. So you do have to initiate it on the Navian, uh, and that sequence is found in the iFlow manual and in the um, Navian manual as to how to do that. But now we're going to look at the temperature. So we've got a potentiometer here. This potentiometer simulates an outdoor sensor. So we can run this from you know, 70 or 80 degrees right down to 40 or 50 or 20 degrees if we want. So we've just got a call for heat from the thermostat. If we look at the board, you can see that we've got a red light where the, where the heat call is. So we know there's a call for heat. But let's go on to the board now. Go into information mode. We'll go into, so the outdoor temperature is 75 degrees. So it's quite warm. So if we look to the Navian now, you'll see that as it starts up, the temperature is very low. Because the outdoor temperature is so low that we don't need any excessive heat from the boiler. Then the Navian comes on, blower modulates down nice and low, flame is nice and low, delivering only the BTUs we need. So let's go back to the iFlow. So now we're going to go back to the iFlow. We're going to go into parameter 5, which is our outdoor temperature. And then we're going to reduce that temperature. So now we're, let's bring it down to 50 degrees to start. So we're not so fall day, it's getting really cool. Alright, good enough. Let's see what the Navian does now. So this Navian, it might take some time to respond, but it will, it will gradually come up and you'll see that the 
Okay, so there it starts, 115. Okay, we can hear the burner starting to pick up a little bit there. So now we're 117, 118. You can hear the burn just ramping up so gently. Right, the blower is ramping up, the burner is ramping up. Now 119, 120, 122. Again, nobody's doing any, anything on the set point. It's all done with communication between the left and the left. Now we're up to So let's bring this down a little further. Temperature simulated. So now, what do we have on the, the Navian boiler? 140, 142. So again, automatically calibrating between the two to deliver only the BTUs that we need. And as it gets colder outside, we ramp up the heating that the Navian is delivering into the. Uh, And then let's drop this to the maximum. So we'll drop this down. So that is just an example of the, uh, the iPhone having communication. And this is with the iPhone 18,000 unit, 18,000 W, in conjunction with the Navian uh, uh, NCB remaining. So all we, all we wanted to demonstrate there is you saw how as the outdoor temperature dropped, and we just simulated that drop, then what happened? The eye flow picked up, right? Picked up the amount of CFM delivered. It told the Navian, hey, I need more heating, so give me a hotter temperature. The Navian, obviously seeing that, that higher delta D goes, okay, I need to deliver more BTU. So it ramped up its burner, ramped up its, its, uh, its blower. So you heard everything ramp up as we needed more and more heat on both sides. And we could do the opposite. As the temperature comes down, we ramp down. So we're just delivering the BTUs you need into the house based on the outdoor temperature. We've also got the return air temperature sensor to make sure that, hey, if we're delivering a little bit too much or not enough, then we can adjust. We've got outdoor feedback and we have indoor feedback, both feeding back into the unit to deliver really uh, the, best, the best comfort that you can get out of any, any system. So to finish it up, um, you know, why consider a combi system? Well, it's all about better comfort, better savings, better efficiency. Um, technology is changing, and it's changing rapidly. Um, you see by this whole electrification and the move to heat pumps, um, that's just one aspect. We see it in smartphones, we see it in cars, we see it in <laughs> rockets taking passengers to, into space. All things that, again, 20 years ago were just, you know, dreams. Something we saw in Star Trek or something that, you know, um, you wouldn't think would be, would be uh, uh, real, but it's all coming together today. So um, it's 2023. We have better technology. There are better HVAC solutions. So if your house isn't comfortable, uh, either on the heating side or the cooling side, you don't take that for an answer. There are, there are solutions. If we don't say anything and we just say, except, well, that's, that's my HVAC system. It's not. There are solutions. We can solve any problem in your, in your home as long as we have the right equipment in there. But 
again, from, from Einstein, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So if we don't change the equipment, if we don't change the, the, uh, the way we're doing things, we're going to have the same results, unfortunately, which are, you know, stratification in the home and uncomfortable temperatures, differences from room to room. That's all going to be there continuously where we can actually do it better. Um, you know, a lot of people are busy. The economy is doing okay. You know, unemployment's at its lowest uh, level in, 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 in years. Um, everybody's busy. Maybe they're missing it, right? We're not, we're, we're so busy in what we do that we're not integrating the new technology uh, as we should. Um, iFlow, we think, is, is the new solution, right? It's, it is the new technology. So, with that said, um, you know, it's an, it's an HVAC evolution. Um, maybe it's a revolution, uh, but either way, it's just better HVAC solutions and better comfort for you, the homeowner. So, um, better savings, better efficiency, lower GHGs, uh, doubling the efficiency of a system. We've got all the equipment. It's all fully variable, uh, variable speed, fully modulating, and uh, available uh, now throughout North America. So again, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is is on the card, uh, or or by uh, or by cell. Either way, uh, but thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Hope this uh, hope the video was helpful. We look forward to seeing you next time on uh, the iFlow HVAC series. Thank you.